Norman Solomon is our guest today on Newsbeat. Norman, thanks for joining us. Very glad to be here. Uh, so, Norman, the book is called War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Toll of Its Military Machine. Uh, to start, can you talk about why you decided to write this book and what you hope readers will take away from it? It's hard to talk about what people don't talk about and try to bring into a clear picture what, as the title alludes to, is almost invisible for our day-to-day -day lives and as news consumers, so to speak. The reality is that very few of us have any direct experience uh, with wars and especially what happens when the U.S. launches its attacks, what the results are in human terms on the other end of the firepower that the Pentagon has. So ultimately, and really unfortunately, uh, people in the United States are overwhelmingly dependent on what they are told. It's sort of that old adage, what are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? Well, our own eyes don't get a chance to see what's going on in, in the past in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or right now, uh, here we are, uh, more than halfway through 2023, United States troops in Africa and Central America, elsewhere, or Latin America, we're just uh, sort of clueless. So I really had the first words of this uh, book written in the title, War Made Invisible, because that's really been a trend in the last uh, couple of decades. It was at least well known, and there were images of the U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the boots on the ground are mostly not there anymore, but the U.S. firepower is. And now, one of the main themes of your book is the media's culpability in spreading with great vigor uh, propaganda to help sell. Uh, the post 9-11 wars to the American people. In effect, the media, especially in the early days of these wars, uh, perhaps when it was most critical to scrutinize what the government was saying, went beyond being stenographers and effectively turned into cheerleaders um, for the so-called global war on terror. So from covering it at the time and reliving this period while writing your book, what impact would you say the media had on the United States' ability to execute these wars? Tremendous impact, as you say, uh, enormous vigor, and we might combine those two concepts, which I think are useful ones, cheerleading and stenographic services, sort of uh, stenographic cheerleading. Especially at the outset, the assumptions were locked in pretty much. And so after the horrible attacks on 9-11, September 11th, 2001, it wasn't foreordained that the U.S. government response would be to go to war, much less to go to war at a country, Afghanistan, that not one of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 were from. And there were, in fact, possibilities that were very real for negotiations with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan, and yet the response was mass frenzy. It was a combination from the White House, from Congress, and from the mass media. And so from the very outset, there was this explosion of, among other things, what I refer to in the book as preemptive absolution for whatever the United States would do militarily. And this was said very boldly by the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, a few weeks into the U.S. attack on Afghanistan, we're talking now October of 2001, Rumsfeld said, every person who dies in Afghanistan, whether they're Americans, whether they're Afghan civilians or anybody else, it's all the fault of the hijackers. It's all the fault of those who attacked the United States. Well, that's just a, a blank check. Uh, not only financially for the Pentagon, but also morally, ethically, psychologically, to say, well, no matter what happens in the future, no matter how many people the United States may kill, including innocent civilians, our hands are clean because we were attacked on 9-11. And so we can look at now more than 20 years uh, since 9-11 and the continuation of the so-called war on terror, which does continue to this moment and see that there was this 
wonderful from the standpoint of the weapons makers and the war makers, this a wonderful uh, preset, uh, beautific, honorific uh, blessing on the head of Uncle Sam. Go for it. Uh, you've got to kill people. That's going to make things better. And, and Norm, you obviously mentioned the invisible nature of these wars um, for people back home. Obviously, one of the things you write about extensively in the book are the innocent people who have died in these wars and these countries that Americans, I think, still today don't even realize that we've been occupying um, or just have troops in, especially in in, in, Af in Africa, um, along with the, the drone campaign there and elsewhere. Uh, Brown University Cost of War Project says upwards of 315,000 people um, potentially in Iraq have died as a direct result of the invasion, uh, I think up until uh, March of this year. It also stated that 70,000 Afghan and Pakistani civilians, because obviously the border over there uh, have perished as a result of the war. Uh, can you talk about the huge civilian death toll and how the media's, I guess, failings have potentially enabled the war machine to take so many innocent lives? There are so many stunning numbers that are, if anything, conservative about the results of the U.S. war making since 9-11 and we know from our own human experience, or at least empathy in the United States, where the number uh, 2,996, which is the official figure of those who were killed by the hijackers on 9-11, those numbers tell us something. And then there's the human reality that really puts the numbers to shame and the grief, the anguish, the anger that understandably uh, erupted in the U.S. Uh, beginning that terrible day in September 11th, that is a, a human response. What's been really difficult for the people of the United States because of the messaging from politicians and because of the mass media coverage, it's been so difficult to grasp intellectually or emotionally that the same kind of experiences um, have occurred when the United States was responsible for the killing. So as you allude to at Brown University's Costs of War project, there are numbers about the direct and then the indirect results of the U.S.-driven so-called war on terror. So uh, more than 300,000 civilians directly killed, according to Brown University, by the U.S. But that's just the beginning. I mean, that total number was close to 1 million. There was a report that has just come out 4.5 million people directly and indirectly killed by the U.S. so-called war on terror in the past now 22 years or so. That's an unfathomable number of people, 4.5 million people killed because the United States decided to launch a war of vengeance because 3,000 people were killed in the United States. It's not a dimension of the tragedy, really, to add up numbers. It's these are all human beings. And that's really at a core of the book. And to get back to your initial question, a main reason I wrote this book is because the invisibility of people that have been killed and are still being killed by the Pentagon is corrosive. It's ethic, whatever language you want to use, ethically, morally, spiritually corrosive to who we are as individuals in the United States, to the extent we internalize that. And in terms of the country, the United States of America, the conduct of the government and the discourse or the lack of discourse. So when we really try to grasp what's at stake, it's really multi-layer of people's lives are at stake. And then who are we as a country? One aspect that I get into in the book, and again, this goes to the indivisibility reference in the title, is that there are essentially tacitly two layers of grief that are officially sanctified and propagated in U.S. mass media and politics, whether we're talking Congress or the White House. There is a discounted, virtually invisible level of grief which is those who die because of uh, Pentagon military actions. And they're basically unreported. If they are reported about occasionally, uh, 
there's not a sense of empathy or uh, depiction of human beings who really have suffered and their their loved ones and so forth. Very rarely is that empathy even conveyed because the news coverage is so sparse. So that's one layer of grief that is discounted to the point that Americans are encouraged often by basically by omission not to recognize at all these people. Um, and we would might say, well, gee, uh, that's in spite of the fact that the U.S. government killed those people. It's not only in spite of the fact, it's because of the fact that the U.S. killed those people that that entire layer of grief is considered unimportant, not recognized, is invisible, and uh, discounted as the experience of essentially non-persons. And there are a lot of reasons for that, as I go into in the book, a nationalism, the conformity of U.S. media and politics, racial bias institutionalized and individual in the United States. And then there's the other layer of grief. That's us. That's Americans who die, whether on 9-11 or troops uh, who have died in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, occasionally Syria and elsewhere, or in a sense, honorary Americans, you might say, those who are allied with the U.S. ideologically or live in a country run by those who are allied with the U.S. Ukraine, a very obvious example, killed by designated official enemies of the United States, in this case, Russia. And that's a whole other layer of grief. That one is, wow, this is uh, so uh, heartrending. This is so horrific, what is being done. What suffering has occurred for these people? Well, that's the way it should be for everybody. We need a single standard of human rights, a single standard of humanity. And so when you look at, and I would sort of you know, wrap up my point here, that if we consider the U.S. media, mass media coverage of the war in Ukraine, if you set aside the extreme political bias, the tinting of the window on the world, red, white, and blue, the failure to acknowledge that the United States uh, can't just go around saying, do as we say, not as we do. If you look at the human interest reporting from U.S. media about what has been going on for a year and a half now in Ukraine, the suffering of civilians, it's excellent journalism. When you contrast it to U.S. coverage of the civilians who have died in countries that the United States has invaded, notably Afghanistan and Iraq, it's just like a 180. It's like, oh, wow, we'll just occasionally mention it. That's a intellectual and emotional corruption that exists in Congress and the White House and in the mass media. Norman, I wanted to talk about another, another element of the book. Um, and it's something that I guess has turned into a a pseudo-philosophical debate within the government. And that is this whole notion of what is war? You know, which is quite frankly, we find, you know, beyond disturbing in itself to, you know, asking that right now. So you write about this in the context of the NATO mission in Libya in 2011. And as all our listeners, I'm sure, are aware, Congress hasn't actually declared war on another country since World War II. So everything that's transpired over the last two decades is the result of the 2001 and 2002 uh, AUMFs, authorizations for use of military force. Uh, the government itself has brought in the interpretation of the AUMF uh, passed by Congress following 9-11 to seemingly justify war wherever and against whichever group the U.S. deems to be hostile. So. My question is, how has the definition of war changed over the years? And do you think it's likely that Congress has any intention of retaking that power from the executive branch? Congress really hasn't shown much intention at all. There's periodic discussion of uh, rewriting, revising the authorization for use of military force that was passed, as you note, right after 9-11 and then re redone uh, the year later. And it seems to be simply discussion of, well, we need an update. You know, we need a newer model of this vehicle and so forth. Whereas the prerogative of the United States uh, 
uh, to intervene militarily in other countries really doesn't um, get much questioning. And I think the war that you refer to in terms of Libya is very significant because it goes again to this consistent through line of U.S. military and foreign policy for many decades, which is that wars are what we say they are, and the important wars are the ones where Americans die. And so what happened with Libya is a case in point where the United States led U.S. Uh, NATO bombing of Libya for more than six months. And within a few months, it, the USA had spent upwards of one billion with a B dollars to be bombing Libya. And the uh, War Powers Act that had been enacted at the end of basically the Vietnam War was supposed to recover some of the uh, leverage that Congress by constitutional provision really has. Article 1, Section 8, I think it's Clause 11, says that it's the Congress that declares war. It's the Congress that decides these matters of military uh, activity by the United States overseas. And yet one president after another has basically ignored that. So the War Powers Act was uh, put into law as a partial remedy of that. After 90 days, uh, the Congress needs to give approval after the U.S. Uh, president, the commander-in-chief, has put troops into war. And yet, when that deadline had been passed, the Obama administration sent a former uh, high-ranking uh, official of the Yale Law School to testify on Capitol Hill, and uh, Professor Coe told the lawmakers and the country that the United States actually was not at war because no Americans had died. And so the claim was that, therefore, the War Powers Act uh, was not relevant. And that says a lot. Uh, and it's uh, both in its own right and a metaphor, an indication of just how jingo narcissism, you might say, has guided U.S. foreign policy and military action that might set well for those who have been acculturated to that kind of red, white, and blue nationalism. But it shouldn't be a surprise to us that many people around the world don't see it as sensible or moral at all. Norman, I have a quick follow-up to something that you said before, before I move on to my next question. And it has to do with the um, the civilian death toll again, and the invisible nature, as you mentioned. Um, I just wonder what you made of sort of the media's response to um, Biden's pulling out of Afghanistan the tra in the traditional sense of war, as you've noted that that's sort of evolved. Um, and the the rhetoric around the safety for Afghan women and children and, uh, and other people um, due to, uh, you know, Taliban violence and everything else, when they never made these same you know, um, aired these same grievances or complaints when I had to do with the U.S. military um, sort of occup occupation and invasion. Um, and they only did this for a short period of time. And again, they never really went into this stuff for the previous two decades. So I'm just wondering what your reaction to that when it was happening, of uh, the, the the rhetoric around um, what was going to happen to the Afghan civilians now, but why this never came up before. It rings so hollow, unfortunately. Uh, for one thing, the U.S. is uh, joined at the hip with the Saudi Arabian regime, which is, treats women terribly. Uh, the fact is that after the United States, finally, after 20 years, uh, pulled its troops out of Afghanistan, the U.S. basically absconded with uh, several billion dollars worth of money that belonged to the Afghan government before uh, the Taliban became that government. And I chronicle in the book how the U.S. at a time of famine, uh, the first winter and subsequently after that withdrawal, basically said, no, we're not giving you the money. Well, there, this undermined the Central Bank of Afghanistan. It made it uh, more real that people would starve to death. A massive malnutrition in Afghanistan, huh, that included women, that included girls. So it's... Uh, a political football, it's a rhetorical football where the Biden administration and Republicans is bipartisan, 
it was basically who cares. Uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders and uh, another senator, Chris Murphy, they tried to get the Biden administration to move quickly on this. Some members of the Progressive Caucus, likewise, and uh, the administration really did not budge. And the results were we had many men, women, children, people of all ages dying and being severely malnutritious, mal- malnourished because of a decision made in Washington by people who claim to really care about the well-being of Afghan people. And that in no way says anything good about the Taliban. It does say that these pretexts for war and these rationales for war really don't hold up when you come right down to it. Yeah, and Norman, um, one thing I really appreciate about the book is how you sort of seamlessly like weave together, you know, all these themes and issues um, that that sort of shed light on the on the sort of corrupt nature of the wars itself. You bring up the point about um, oil in Iraq and how that that's sort of like treated as like a conspiracy now, I think, or even back then, like when you were talking about, oh, it was just about oil and people would shrug it off. But you note that it was sort of, it was, you could explain to our listeners, but it was, oil in Iraq was nationalized, right? And then after the war um, and, and the invasion, our fossil fuel companies came in and began to began to profit off of that. We also did a, um, an ep- episode about disaster capitalism and sort of the, the, the corporate um, profiteering off off of these wars and how they enriched themselves. Um, so I was just wondering, can you just talk about sort of the rise of the war industry, but also the, that corporate profiteering that happened that a lot of Americans, I would argue, um, is also sort of invisible. They, they never, they didn't really see this happen. There's no doubt that there are many factors in a war. And I also think there's no doubt that in the case of the Iraq invasion, oil was a huge one of those factors. I remember back in the middle of and late 2002 when it became increasingly clear that the Bush administration was bent on, and this was George W. Bush administration, was bent on the invasion of Iraq, when certain members of Congress, Dennis Kucinich was one of them, would say that a big motivator was all the oil, the massive amount of oil in Iraq. People who said that were denounced. Uh, They were told by very powerful media and political figures, how can you say that? Oil has nothing to do with this. It's just a a calumny against the U.S. government and on the value of our our motives. And yet in the book, uh, I quote a number of people, Alan Greenspan, uh, uh, the noted uh, Federal Reserve Chair, uh, John Abizade, uh, the the high-ranking general, Uh, We had uh, a former uh, senator and then uh, Secretary of Defense also, all three of them saying, acknowledging years later, that oil was a huge factor in why the United States invaded. And as you refer to, it was nationalized. The uh, U.S.-based oil companies, British-based oil companies, uh, they couldn't get through the door under the Saddam Hussein regime. But in the aftermath of the invasion and the toppling of that regime, these oil companies and those services like Halliburton that Vice President Cheney was integral to, they made out like bandits. I mean, this is billions of dollars at stake. And there were uh, confirmed reports that the uh, Cheney vice presidential office had maps before the invasion showing where oil was located in Iraq and the grade of the oil in different parts of the country and the depth and how difficult it would be uh, to extract the oil in different regions of Iraq. So it, it's it's a scam when the mass media and the political leaders in Washington tout all these august motives for reasons for going to war and in the process killing a lot of people and in the process making huge profits uh, for, I won't say defense contractors, I'm saying military contractors. Ever since 9-11, it's just been a heightened boondoggle. And Dwight Eisenhower called it a a military-industrial complex as he left the White House. We could now call it a military-industrial intelligence surveillance Uh, industry that has just 
uh, exploded in terms of its magnitude. We now have just the uh, military budget of the Pentagon, let alone nuclear weapons budget, now up around $900 billion with a B dollars every year. And if you look at what's happened in the last 20 years, very quickly after 9-11, from Baltimore, Washington, uh, BWI Airport, all around there, all around the Pentagon, what is uh, unfortunately called Reagan Airport in Northern Virginia, there was just the upsurge of the, a lot of shingles went up very quickly. And war profiteers were just able to siphon billions of dollars of profits. And this is still going on today. And it's going on among many other ways, not only through the aerospace industry that is now so much central part of U.S. war making, but also in terms of the way in which uh, the United States is moving ahead to ship massive amounts of weapons to Ukraine. Skip around for a second here, just because you mentioned Ukraine. And um, I was wondering if you could sort of comment on or explain for listeners, um, you know, the U.S.'s stance uh, regarding these cluster bombs and cluster munitions um, prior to Ukraine and now uh, as, as the main supplier of, of arms to, uh, to, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, you know, we, we were talking about it earlier, uh, Rashad and I, and, and we just sort of see it as this, in the context and the lens of your book, you know, this sort of perfect, pseudo perfect example of the blatant hypocrisy, um, not only uh, regarding foreign policy when it comes to things that we do, as opposed to what other nations do, but also in terms of the coverage uh, by the mainstream media. Um, so yeah, if you could weigh in on that. As it happened, I spent uh, quite a few days and uh, some pages of the War Made Invisible book about cluster munitions. It was really striking to me that the United States and Russia, and for that matter, Ukraine, are in a minority. Those three countries are among those nations on the planet that have not ratified the international treaty banning cluster munitions, which are among the most very terrible, uh, cruel, sadistic weapons that have ever been used in warfare. And when the United States led the NATO attacks on Yugoslavia in 1999, there was some use of cluster bombs. And I write in the book about an attack one afternoon on the city of Nice in Yugoslavia, and people were at the market and these pellets, these thousands of, of shards, really, of shrapnel that go horizontally when they get near the ground, uh, they, according to the industry, they go at soft targets. Uh, we would say they uh, shred the bodies of human beings. And in this case, for instance, there was a, a woman, she, she was found dead in a pool of blood clutching her carrots that she just bought at the market. This is the basic characteristic of cluster munitions. And I write in the book how the United States used a lot of them during the opening weeks of the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Each cluster bomb has, or munition has, what they call bomblets, which are really smaller um, ways to carry and then explode and send out these shards um, of shrapnel. And how many of those were used? Well, I found a report from the Congressional Research Service saying that between 1.8 million and 2 million shra shrapnel uh, carrying bomblets were used by the U.S. in those three weeks of the invasion of Iraq. Obviously horrible um, and Fast forward, and I write about this in the book, that when Russia invaded Ukraine in February of last year, there was justifiably condemnation of the fact that the Russian forces used cluster munitions. Uh, the White House uh, suggested that it was a war crime, and the U.S. mass media condemned what was going on, front page stories in places like the New York Times, talked about how horrific the cluster munitions are as a weapon. Uh, 
So we're talking February, March of 2022. And now we are in 2023 in the summer. And just recently, the Biden administration ordered that massive numbers of cluster munitions be sent to the Ukrainian government for use in the war there. Well, you know, can you have it both ways? If you are immersed in in double speak, as uh, George Orwell described it in 1984, you can have it both ways. That is, while there's been a bit of U.S. media critique of this decision by Biden, relatively little condemnation compared to what was uh, levied at the Russian government 18 months earlier. And this is a, a case in point of how there's a intellectual, moral, ethical corruption that goes on when the window on the world is tinted red, white, and blue to such an extreme extent. And no wonder a lot of people can become uh, very uh, cynical about what's involved here with warfare. And I would sum up by saying that just because there's so much hypocrisy in Washington on such matters, it doesn't in any way justify what Russia is doing in Ukraine. At the same time, just because what Russia is doing in Ukraine is so horrible, that in no, no way justifies the hypocrisy in Washington that's not only hypocrisy, but results in and continues to result in the deaths and injuries and mournings of so many people. And one example is that, yes, we're against one country invading another uh, and slaughtering people and bombing and strafing civilians. And yet the United States, uh, beginning in 2015, under uh, President Obama, then under President Trump, and then under President Biden, has supported, including with weaponry, the Saudi Arabian government as it slaughters massive numbers of people uh, in Yemen. And in point of fact, we have a reality, according to the UN, that there was, as a result, the uh, biggest cholera epidemic in history that directly and indirectly because of this war led by Saudi Arabia with U.S. support, close to 400,000 people have died in the last eight years in Yemen. And one aspect that, again, points up what really caused me to try to write the best book that I can, in this case with uh, War Made Invisible, is that these double standards are, as I mentioned before, so corrosive. And here would be an example. Uh, near where I live and probably near where you live, if you do much walking around and driving around, you will see a Ukrainian flag in solidarity with Ukrainian people with recognition of their suffering. You could go for hundreds of miles and not find a Yemeni flag. And yet, why is that? It's because in spite of the fact, or we could say because of the fact, that the U.S. government is part of the slaughter of people in Yemen, there's just no recognition in the mass culture and the mass politics and the mass media of the country. Yeah, uh, Norman, I appreciate you bringing up you know that war and the, and the implications of everything there. Um, I do want to take a sort of like all encompassing look at what's transpired over the last, I guess, twenty two years. Um, when you consider the illegal justification for the Iraq War, the human rights abuses, and all the countries that we were entangled in, uh, Guantanamo Bay, the expansion of the surveillance state, drone warfare, as we mentioned, the broadened definition of war itself and what that means the growing U U.S. troop presence around the world. I think it's 750 bases now by the last count. Also in Africa, which I, again, I don't think a lot of Americans are aware of. The historic, I mean, historic crackdown of whistleblowers uh, led really by President Obama during his administration. And then all the, all the while, there's just economic inequality and devastation that took hold domestically. Everything just seems to be connected to what happened post 9-11 and our response to that. Um, so do you think the media and the general public, which I don't really blame them, but I do, obviously, the, I think the corporate media is really um, at fault, will ever truly reflect on the consequences of the post-9-11 wars and everything that's occurred? And 
if not, what are the consequences of not reckoning, reckoning with what happened? Uh, self-reflection is really a long shot and the consequences are severe because we retain a sort of a fog of war around our own society. A lot of that has to include burying history. And we know that most Americans are well familiar with, because of media and political repetition, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream, 1963, beautiful speech, very needed and appropriate for that historical moment. Four years later, when Dr. King gave a speech at Riverside Church in New York City, April 4th, 1967, um, he denounced what he called the madness of militarism, and he referred to what he called the destructive demonic suction tube. Those are his words. Destructive demonic suction tube of massive military spending while people at home are suffering from lack of basic resources, money for taking lives uh, taken away from possible sustenance to sustain lives. And those two speeches are both part of the historic record, but it's extremely rare in any U.S. media, especially mass media, to get any reference whatsoever to that 19 second, 1967 speech by Dr. King in general or his specific denunciations of militarism and that demonic suction tube. And we're suffering from that all the time. And as you say, the connections are, are so intricate and so real in so many ways. And uh, some might call it intersectionality. Some might call it just being real about how different aspects of a society are connected. This reminds me of, I think, a troubling reality, which is that in the politics of our country right now, there's a, a sort of echo of what during the Vietnam War and afterwards for a while was called Cold War liberalism. There are members of Congress who are articulate and fight like hell for poor people, for people of color, for the elderly, for the children who are being deprived of adequate nutrition with the tax on the essentially food stamp programs. And a lot of those people in Washington, in Congress, and indeed uh, President Biden, when it gets to foreign policy, they are militarists and they refuse to acknowledge, let alone respond to the dire connections that Dr. King was pointing to. You know, and on that note, you know, you've traveled the world in your reporting and, you know, just speaking about the invisibility of some of the, of the ramifications, the, the, the people, the suffering, you know, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experiences in refugee camps specifically, um, you know, maybe some people you met, some things you saw, because I feel that those places especially are, at least in my opinion, uh, nearly completely absent uh, from coverage. Uh, rarely are they talked about, um, let alone shown. So if you could please uh, share some of that for, with listeners. Well, this book is really indebted to uh, reporters like the foreign correspondent Reese Ehrlich, who I traveled with a bit, but who had reported from 40 countries. Uh, the great journalist Nick Terse, who has reported extensively from the Middle East and from Africa and has chronicled realities at many refugee camps in Africa, for instance. And so a lot of what I've learned has been through great journalists like them, my acquaintance and experience with refugee camps relatively limited and left me with very visceral emotions about what the human costs are of warfare. When I went to Afghanistan in 2009, and I was only in Kabul for about five days there, I was told about a refugee camp on the outskirts of the city. So um, I went there and these were largely people who had come from southern Afghanistan, a lot of them from Helmand province, which is um, 
is a place where a lot of the U.S. military activity went on during 20 years. Uh, in particular, a lot of a lot of bombing uh, that the U.S. engaged in in Helmand Province, and we sometimes uh, forget or or don't realize that 70 percent of Afghanistan is rural, and very few journalists ever ventured much out of the big cities, you know, maybe Kandahar, but basically uh, in, in Kabul. And so when I went to that camp, I was just, I was just really shocked. It's not that I wasn't already cynical, but here were people driven out of basically um, war zones that the United States had created. They came to, Af they came to the, the capital city of the country and they were in this really, uh, it's almost, you can't even almost call it accurately a refugee camp because it was a bunch of tarps and ditches. And I met, uh, one of the families I met um, had a seven-year-old girl who had lost her arm when before dawn in her neighborhood, the U.S. dropped bombs uh, from um, the Pentagon's immense storehouse of, of bombs. And there she was. Uh, she and her father had come to this refugee camp far from home, far from their home in Helmand Province, which was no longer safe. And without one arm, she was trying to grow up. And her father next to her showed me some papers he had been filling out and filing with the uh, Afghan government, getting no aid. And he was in charge of providing or sharing food in the camp and had a plastic bag with like a few pounds of rice to share with what I was told was about a hundred people in the camp. And I walked away from that camp thinking the U S government had so much money to bomb these people, but no money to feed them. I mean, it was just really horrible. And that was a specific instance and also a metaphor for priorities and it reminded me that when I got back um, from Afghanistan, I went to some hearings. Now, this was 2009, and uh, if I remember correctly, the Democrats did not control the House then. Uh, so they were not official hearings, but the Progressive Caucus in the House held a number of uh, basically de facto informational hearings on Capitol Hill, and I, I went to a couple of those, and they were, they were pretty damn good. And uh, one member of Congress represented the Progressive Caucus and took recommendations to then the new president, President Obama, and said, we think that the U.S. expenditures in Afghanistan should be 80% humanitarian aid and 20% military. And President Obama came back with a budget request that was 90% military. And that, of course, was part of the, the Afghan surge where Obama sent so, tens of thousands more troops into Afghanistan. And just a bit of a digression, but a day ago I watched a hearing that occurred uh, a few days before that uh, in the House. And, of course, now the House of Representatives is run by uh, Republicans, so it was a Republican chair. And this references an, an earlier topic we were talking about. The focus was the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And for an acknowledge, I would, you know, admittedly the withdrawal was bungled and it, it should have been done much better, better planned, less suffering as a result. But the focus of that hearing was how terrible it was that the United States lost the war in Afghanistan. And while there was some legitimate concern expressed about the ill-planned, hasty, uh, bad way in which the United States withdrew, the underlying messaging was that the United States needs to learn how to win these wars and that the tragedy, and this was a message that I quote from mass media in the book as well, the tragedy of the U.S. war in Afghanistan and the withdrawal, according to the official narrative, is that the United States lost the war. And if you take a more, I think, a human look at it, uh, 
The real tragedy is that the war was inflicted on people to begin with. That's incredible, Norman. And I don't, I don't recall, I could be wrong because I don't, I don't follow all the hearings that come out of D.C., but I don't recall a hearing related to the Afghan um, uh, papers, Afghanistan papers that came out um, a few years ago, uh, during that time of the withdrawal, I think, um, about how the, the government effectively lied to the American people about the war effort, very similar to what happened with the Pentagon Papers and, and Vietnam, right? So, and, and again, I don't think the media, again, had enough focus on that as compared to every, everything else, right? I don't yeah. think there's ever been a, maybe you recall, but I don't think there's ever been a hearing about the, the lies that were told. Yeah, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. You know, it's it's all very, I'm not familiar with such hearings and a lot of it is, is through a partisan lens, unfortunately. And um, when there's a Democrat in the White House, Democrats, uh, so to speak, circle the wagons around the president and, and same with the Republican. And then there's a, a lot of jockeying for advantage. Um, I think that if we look at, and that's a good comparison between the Pentagon Papers and what ultimately emerged through reporting by the Washington Post and the Intercept about uh, the Afghan war, the sort of received wisdom and emphasis, especially say the Washington Post reporting and uh, the Pentagon Papers, what eventually emerged is that the war couldn't be won and that U.S. public was lied to because we were told the war could be won when even people in charge in their candid private moments knew that the war was not going badly, contrary to what they were saying, and the war was not going to be won. And I think that's one layer of deception, and it's a significant one. But as Daniel Ellsberg, who released the Pan Papers, of course, said, it wasn't that the United States was on the wrong side in Vietnam, it was the wrong side. And so a layer underneath the lies about claiming officially that the war could be won or was being won when it wasn't, was the deeper reality that the war itself was a crime, whether it could be won or lost. Yeah, Norman, and you've been very gracious with your time. I have one last question, and it's sort of just a um, again, an overarching is just what is your sort of, if you could uh, teach all the journalists in the U.S., especially in in uh, corporate mainstream media, how best to cover these conflicts. Um, I'm not sure that that can be resolved. I just think that the system itself is unfortunately corrupt. It's controlled by um, a few corporations and that's dispensed to the majority of the American public. So I don't know if we can actually fix that or if it can be fixed internally. Um, but I'm just wondering, what's the, what do you think is a, is a solution to, you know, making these people who, you know, we're saying are invisible, actually visible, um, spreading more empathy and um, not devaluing these lives just because they're not American citizens. I'm wondering how you would approach it um, in, in a journalistic way. I don't know if it's, you know, spreading these pictures all across um, TV sets or social media. I don't know what the answer is, but you know, what's your, um, what do you say about that? In one small way, I've wanted the book War Made Invisible to be, if not a wake up call for people who perhaps don't want to be woken up, at least to confront the way in which mainstream journalists and their institutions that they work for are morally and ethically and intellectually self-corrupted or willing to defer to corruption. Overall, I think it's really tough because the problems are so institutional. They're so structural. Who owns media? Who advertises in a big way in them? And what are the priorities of people at the very top of these media institutions? And those who work for them can be addressed as individuals and should be at the same time that they're part of these media institutions. It's very difficult for people to bite the hand that signs their paycheck. Maybe now it's just an automatic transfer into their bank account, but it's the same thing. Somebody is providing the pay. And it's been really notable that there are many brave journalists who cover war for U.S. media who go into war zones and they risk their lives. Occasionally, they're wounded, even 
killed. There's no lack of courage there. Then they get back to the newsroom and they're afraid of the managing editor. It's really sad. And I think we need to educate and agitate and challenge and point out these contradictions and build movements that will confront the policies and the mass media that are basically, as we said earlier, stenographic supporters of those policies. I'm a big supporter of the Media Watch Group FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. I urge everybody to go to fair.org, sign up for uh, the action alerts, because for 40 years just about now, FAIR has been not only exposing, but also organizing to challenge these kind of media biases. At the same time, I think that the creation and sustaining and growing of independent media outlets, that's extremely important, both in their own right and because sometimes what work, journalistic work is being done cross-pollinates into the large corporate media because the work done is so well. So I would say Newsbeat should be supported. That's an unsolicited plug. Because if you have an institution like Newsbeat, you have people working together who truly, without fear or favor, are trying to do what journalism should do. As George Orwell said, if reporting, if journalism refuses to challenge the powerful, then it's not really journalism, it's uh, advertising, it's public relations. We've had our fill of public relations. We need some journalism to really permeate our society. Amen to that. Mm, I appreciate and, that. And, and on that note, I mean, the work that you're doing, you know, thank you for the work you're doing. Well, thanks so much for uh, the chance to, to talk with you both and to your listeners. Yes, Norma, we really appreciate um, your time and your insights and everything. Um, if you want to remind uh, listeners uh, the book, how they could find it, and also maybe how they could find you. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, the book is titled War Made Invisible, and the subtitle is How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. It's published by the New Press. It's just been uh, released this summer, 2023, and you can find it pretty much any online bookseller, and also a lot of bookstores have it. There's more information about it at warmadeinvisible.org online. And I see it as part of a process for information and agitation and organizing. And people can always reach me at my own website, which is normansolomon.com. Great, Norman. And we'll make sure to note that um, in our show notes and also our Substack, where we also um, send out more uh, updates um, and more news about each and every episode we do. Again, Norman, we really appreciate you. Thank you for Thank you so much. coming on with us. Really. Oh, thanks to you both. And uh, I hope we can be working together in the future.